You ain't nothing but a hound dog Crying all the time You ain't nothing but a hound dog Crying all the time Well, you ain't never caught a rabbit And you ain't no friend of mine When I said you was high class Well, that was just a lie When I said... Yeah, well, when I was a kid, uh, I had a cousin who played drums. Uh, first cousin, in fact. And he's the only kid in the neighborhood who had a set of drums. He's the only one who could afford it. So uh, every day about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he, he had a grocery store, as folks did. And he lived like right next door to, to the uh, store. And he'd go over there and work a couple hours on drums, playing, you know, just himself and records, listening to big band stuff. And I'd go by there from time to time and sit down and listen to him, watch him play. And then he said, you want to play a couple? Yeah, I'll play. And I didn't know anything about big band music that much, you know. But uh, after you do it a while, you, just like anything else, you, get to, you, could, you learn to do it. So, And that's how we, all of us got started listening to other bands, you know, because we didn't have any money to buy any instruments of any kind, you know. So he was the luckiest one of the bunch. Yeah, well, uh, I did that for years. I worked uh, cocktail lounges, bars. Uh, you just, uh, what you do, you, you go in and whatever, wherever you're playing, learn something. You try to learn something. Whatever it is, you try to learn something. So uh, and that's, we work these bars or whatever. So you'll learn a little bit of something everywhere you go. And uh, I, I finally went over to the Hayride and uh, I was not what they call a country drummer, you know. Uh, so I had to learn to play like they felt, you know, so stick in a brush, pretty quiet, no loud noises, you know. And that's what I did for another 10 or 15 years, you know, just learn to play quiet and easy for them, you know. Uh, hardly any foot pedal, because they, they themselves didn't like bass drums, the artists. And in fact, they couldn't sing with a bass drum. And they, they, most of them sang out of meter. You know what I mean by that? They have a 2-4 bar here, a 3-4 bar there. And just, so I stayed out of the way. I, I wouldn't play the bass drum. I played it up here, you know as I could. So if it had to turn the beat over, you don't turn it over without worrying about that bass drum. So that's, I learned, that's how I learned to play, just turn, turn the beat around for them. That way nobody sounded like a, like a train wreck out there, you know. They had a big, it was a very sheer curtain, it wasn't a very really heavy curtain. And uh, when it first started, they said, well, you have to play back there. I said, well, how come, you know? Well, you know, we've got country artists and they don't know anything about drums and one thing and another. I said, well, okay. I went back, I want to stay back there two or three weeks, you know, until Elvis come on, you know. He said, well, bring the boy out here, you know, we need to hear him, what he's doing. So he was the one who really got us on stage, Elvis. He said, let, let him play, heck, you know. And uh, after that, then they, everybody wanted drums in. Oh, that sounds really good, guys. Uh, you want to play with me? No, I'm tired. And then I got tired, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> he walked in, and I knew he was, and he had, uh, these funny clothes, I call them funny clothes, you know, peg pants and the belts and the shirts and ties and everything. And uh, Scott had come over and said, hey, uh, we're going to do a couple of tunes and I, you, you want to work with us? I said, yeah, uh, that's why I'm here. So I think they did That's Right. He didn't have a couple of songs anyhow, so That's Right, Mama, and maybe one more. And it worked out good, you know, for what he wanted. So he come in a couple of weeks later, same thing, same thing every week. I said, yeah, I'll be glad to do it for you. And he said, hey, we're going to go to Texas for three or four days. You want to go? I said, yeah, I'll go with you. So I went over there and we come back to Hayride again that Saturday night. He said, DJ, we're going to go back to Memphis. He said, we don't have nothing booked. We may never get another job in our lives. You know, just like that. He was serious. I said, oh, you'll get something. Don't worry about it. And uh, he said, if I do, I'll call you. And if you, you know, you want to work with us a while. I said, yeah. So I was about a week or so late. He called. He said, uh, hey, we've got four more days out in Texas. you want to go? I said, heck yeah, I'll go with you. So it started kind of gradually. Built up to that point, and then I, then I was a regular after a while, you know. He said, we're going to do this Heartbreak Hotel for these friends of mine, May Axton, you know, and them. And uh, we did. Got a good cut on it, finally. And uh, Chet Atkins, the guitar player, everybody knows Chet, he was playing rhythm guitar. And so Scott says, Chet, you want to play lead? And he said, your turn, boy, you got it. You, you have to play. And uh, Scotty did, he did a great job, and but he was, he was afraid to play in front of Chet, like everybody else is, who, who's not, you know. Uh, the guy's a genius on guitar, so 
and you got a little guy up trying to play something, and it scares you to death, you know, you just you don't want to get out there and play. But he did a good job. Good job. Scotty Bill had joined him first. They were the original guys. Well, he kept they kept asking for a raise, for a raise, for a raise, you know, and uh, you know, they never did get it, so they decided just to quit, and they did. Just for a couple of days, and we went up to Washington, up to that part of the country. He called them all back. Well, I say all, Scotty and Bill back. And uh, I never did quit. Actually, I just stayed on. So uh, they, they they did a few eventually. They, and we, we were doing movies by then, so uh, we'd go out and work about two weeks for a movie, track, go home. When he finished up, we'd go back out there and do the same thing over and over. He he, kept, he was doing about three pictures a year, so that made it easier. We just stay home most of the time and do pictures. And we were probably the first band to do anything in the round, as they called it. And uh, he looked good, he was singing good, and that, that little segment that we did, you know, in the round, it really looked good with it for everybody I'm talking about. Not just him, but everybody looked good. Everybody was playing good, so we had a good time doing that one. We really did. Was well, then he called, later they called, and he was going to open in Vegas. Well, we had been to Vegas once, and we didn't like it then. So I said, I don't want to go to Vegas, you know. And Scott said, I don't either. The Jordanaires said, I don't either. We don't want to go back out there. So we just all quit at the same time. I come by when I, I heard, you know, you get you hear it through the grapevine that Elvis was in town. And when Elvis was in town, everybody knew it, you know. So I went by the studio and seen him a couple of times, you know. It was hard as hell to get in, first of all. They didn't let anybody in there. I just lucked out. I knew some of the policemen. There were no security, you know. So yeah, I'm going and he's all, he's sitting in there doing nothing. So I'd go and talk to him for an hour or so, and I'd leave. And, oh, he's the nicest guy in the world. Uh, I don't know where these people got these ideas of well, he's a bad guy, but he was not bad. Uh, he'd do anything in the world for you, give you anything he had. Uh, uh, the guys were with him every day. Uh, we 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 wasn't with him every day. They had houses, they bought them cars, or whatever they wanted that he bought for them. Anything they got now, he bought it. So, how can you beat a guy like that, you know? You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Let me see, hound dog was done in New York. In New York. In New York. Yeah. Okay. I didn't think about that for a while. And was this the first song you played on? No, uh, Heartbreak Hotel. Heartbreak. No, we did that. Here in town, okay. down uh, on right off of Demumbrum Street, uh, there's a couple of car lots in front of the. They tore the building down actually now, yeah, but uh, I don't know why they would have done that. But with the history that you know, Chet Ashton cut there, and Don Gibson cut there, and Ellis cut there, and Jim Reeves cut there. There's so many guys that cut good records out of that yeah. one little room. Well, you know, when you're cutting those kind of records, and uh, uh, most of us didn't read music, so we had to kind of figure out we, what we was going to do, you know. So uh, we knew when the guitar come in, it's going to be loud. So I, I go to the ride symbol, you know. And I knew when the piano comes in, it's going to be a little quieter. So then I go back to the sock pedal over here. So it uh, kind of it's like a contrast of different things going on. And uh, the bass is still playing his usual self, and the Elvis is singing the bass, the same thing. But we had to go up and down because we didn't have any remixes and all that stuff. Whatever you got, that was it. Take it or leave it. Thanks. Well, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I called it that one day, and some of these young kids said, what'd you say? The drummers, and I said, well, this is a hi-hat or sock pedal. We never heard of that. I said, what the hell do you call it, you know? <laughs> so uh, I, I, I've always called it sock pedal or hi-hat, and uh, they didn't seem like they understood what I was talking about. They were a lot younger, though, you know. Everybody's in the same room. The drums were using it, had a little cupboard, maybe a little balcony here, a little, and then the uh, Usually the bass player was here, the piano player was over there. Usually Floyd Kramer played piano on a lot of those things. Uh, uh, then we had Scotty, usually across the room, and maybe another good rhythm guitar player. Elvis is way back around that door there, you know, it's about to 10, 15 feet. And he, he had a little booth that he, he could sing in if he wanted to, but he didn't like to. So he just kind of stood out in the open all the time. He got a better feel of the band and everybody. We played this song on Ed Sullivan, and uh, you know, you get, you get a bunch of guys out of the South, never been to New York, didn't know anything about New York, and you're going to be on the Ed Sullivan show, and at that particular time, 
that was probably the biggest show that you could ever get on. Once you got on Ed Sullivan's show, you had it made, you know, because everybody starts calling you then. So, uh, but it was scary, and then we had the big band behind us, and they were scary. You know, those guys could really play. And they, they, did, they did a couple things with us, you know, just for chasers, and get us off and get us on. When you, it, you can feel the power behind your, your neck. Just, they, they played so hard, you know, and just scared the heck out when you hear those horns back there. And uh, Louis Bells, I think, was playing drums. And that's enough to watch and be scared. He, he, he's such a great drummer. I used to watch him every night just about during rehearsals, you know. He never missed nothing. DJ Fontana again. Now, the, the uh, signature in this particular song, and, uh, it was a uh, drum riff I played in it, and we do it several different times during the whole song, and uh, we thought it'd come out really good. So uh, I'll, I'll play a little bit for you, I'll play a couple bars for you, get an, get an idea of how it worked. One of them. And that's the whole lick, actually. That was it. Slower. That's, that's about what it amounts to. Count to six and get out. <laughs> well, what, what we'll do, I'll, I'll play the high, I'll, I'll play the big cymbal first on the guitar chords. And uh, here's how I finish this thing off at the end of this song. It was a little bit different because I inverted that triplet. Kind of turned it around a little bit. Don't ask me why I did it, I have no idea. <laughs> just, just straight ahead, basically. Just one, two, three, four, one. And usually, uh, uh, I don't like bass drums anyhow, so I very seldom play bass drums. Uh, maybe an accent or something, you know, but I hardly ever play an I can't stand bass drums at all. Uh, maybe I should listen to them more, but I don't. I just get, they get on my nerves after, after a while. Up here, it didn't bother me, but that, that gets on my nerves somewhat. And then with the hi-hat, you're just keeping it, you kind just of... Just keep it straight. It's straight. You have to be. You gotta have that somewhere in the song. So everybody know where they're at. <laughs> Hi, this is DJ Fontana, and you're looking for the uh, performance I did on Hound Dog. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Crying all the time. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Crying all the time.
Well, that was just a lie When they said you was high class Well, that was just a lie Well, you ain't never caught a rabbit And you ain't no friend of mine You ain't nothing but a hound dog Crying all the time No, you ain't nothing but a hound dog Crying all the time Yeah, you ain't never caught a rabbit You ain't no friend of mine